Paul was writing the letter to the church in Rome, and he said this. He said in Romans 1, 16 and 17, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let me pause there for just a moment. A uh, number of years before, not only would Paul have been ashamed of the gospel, but he would have hated the gospel. Like he hated the good news. That's what gospel means for those of you that may be new to the word gospel. Uh, he hated the news about Jesus so much that he was willing to persecute the church and those who followed Christ. And so for Paul to say this, this many years later, that he who was one who hated the gospel, now he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Just so you understand some backstory, if you read Acts and a few other places, uh, Paul literally came within inches of his life many times, from being stoned to being shipwrecked to being beaten to being having to sneak out of cities because he proclaimed the gospel after Jesus showed himself to Paul. And literally it cost Paul his life ultimately for following Jesus, but he knew that didn't matter because eternal life is the greatest reward that we can have. And so he said this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel or the good news of Jesus. And here's what I want you to know this morning, my friends, uh, that where power comes from. It says, because it, that's the good news of Jesus, the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. So here's what he's saying. Paul said, listen, there's no shame in the gospel for me. I don't care what it costs me, what it costs me financially, physically, health-wise. He says, it doesn't matter. I want to share the good news of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of it. Why? Because it is actually God's power. Uh, as I've said many times in the past, I, I love hearing your testimonies. Uh, I love to share my testimony of how God has changed my life. And so those things are important. But the only thing that is really the power of God is the good news of Jesus, of what Jesus did for you and me. And this may sound like some of you may say, yeah, I already know this, uh, but I want to take you through it even this morning in a few minutes in a way we, we learned with our Vacation Bible School students this week uh, of what the gospel really is, the good news of what Jesus came to do for you and for me. And so Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this. It's the power of God. The good news of Jesus is powerful. I don't want you as believers who are here today to ever think that when you share the good news of Jesus with someone, that you need to add something to it. Now, is it good to share our testimony? Is it good to talk about life and deal with problems in life? Absolutely. We need to deal with these things. But I want you to know that when you are bold enough as a follower of Christ to share the good news of Jesus... It's powerful enough on its own. When you talk about why Jesus came, he is God. He came as a perfect man. He died in our place as a sacrifice to pay for our sins, and he beat death. And when you turn from yourself and your sinful nature and believe on Jesus, the power of God unto salvation is great through the good news of Jesus. So it's, it's kind of like C.S. Lewis said, you don't have to defend a lion. You just let a lion loose, and the lion will take care of himself in a much more powerful way the gospel will take care of itself, that we must come to this place, if we're a believer, that we're not ashamed of the good news of Jesus, but we're willing and looking for loving, gracious opportunities to say, hey, here's what Jesus did for you and me. Here's why we need this so much. And when we share that, it is power. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And so uh, just so much there we could unpack this morning. But I want you to understand the premise, not only for VBS, but for Wiregrass Church. I want to take a moment and go back to Matthew uh, this morning uh, to give you a little bit of a, a contrast of children and us as adults. Jesus, a number of times in the Gospels, he talked about um, loving and caring for and blessing little children. It's interesting, Jesus always stuck up for the ones who were defenseless, uh, who needed help, and, and that should be a signature of the church family, that we look out for those who are defenseless from the womb to the tomb, as we say. Uh, and, and so we love those who cannot help themselves. But I think there was a bigger picture Jesus was trying to make in a contrast between kids and between us who are adults. And, and so in Matthew chapter um, uh, 18... Uh, at those first five verses, I'm just going to read those, but then jump into Matthew 19. So you might want to turn in your Bibles there to Matthew 18 and then turn the page to Matthew 19. In Matthew 18, verses 1 through 5, he says that at the time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, uh, 
So who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Was there any self-seeking there? Absolutely, man. They were wanting to promote themselves as we do at times in our life. And they said, hey, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Hoping it, hope, hoping it was going to be one of their names. And Jesus turned their thinking of that day and that culture on its ear. And so in verse 2, he says, He called a child and had him, this little child, stand among them. And then Jesus said in verse 3, Truly I tell you, or amen, I tell you, he said, Unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let me put this in, in perspective. Uh, that uh, the rabbis, the religious leaders, the noblemen, the rich people of that day, they were looked at to be the blessed ones. Man, they were the ones who were the highest ones to look to. And so Jesus was shattering their own viewpoint of people that were really right with God. He'd actually started back at the beginning of Matthew when he told the crowds, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds or goes past those of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, there would have been a collective gasp in that day because everybody looked to these religious leaders as being the people that were right with God. And what we know of as we read the Gospels, while on the outside they looked good, on the inside they were full of, as Jesus said, dead men's bones. And that's the case with us as adults. We, we try to do better and look better on the outside, and Jesus makes this stark contrast where he gave them an answer they weren't looking for. He says, listen, unless you turn change direction, and become like little children, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a very powerful point that he makes there. And here's what you and I can learn from this. What does he mean that we need to become like little children? Do you need to become uh, immature? Uh, do you need to uh, uh, take your sister's or brother's toys or uh, anything like that? No, he's not talking about that. Here's what he's talking about as a child. A child, in his simplest and most basic form, is trusting and dependent and simply believes the truth of what someone who loves them tells them. The problem is, as you and I get older, we get cynical, we get even more hard-hearted, and sometimes we feel like we got to figure it out on our own. And many of us have lived much of our life in that way that, hey, I'm going to get religious, I'm going to get better on my own, I'm going to do my self-improvement program uh, and I'm going to get better. And he said, unless you turn, unless you change and become like little children. It's a little bit like what Jesus told Nicodemus. Unless you're born again, you, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. You're not part of God's family. And so he says here, and he's talking to adults, to you and me, unless we turn and become like children to simply trust and realize how dependent we are. Most of our life, we're trained as, as teenagers and adults and going on through life. We're trained, and we have this desire to be independent. Uh, I knew how strong that was in my life as a teenager and becoming a man and all of that stuff. That Man, I wanted to be independent. I think there's some health to being responsible. But the problem is, is we continue that in through our whole life, and we try to be independent. And what God is wanting to teach us, going back to this passage here, is we need to, as big people, <laughs> as adults, we need to realize how dependent we are on who and what God has provided for us, that we're totally dependent on him. We don't like that because we like to be independent. We feel secure and safe when we're independent. We're taking care of ourselves. But he says, unless you turn and become like children to simply trust, depend upon who he has sent, that's Jesus, you're not going to be a part of God's family. You're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so here's what it looks like. I believe it's a key step, he says in verse 4. Whoever humbles, therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Another statement that turned that whole culture on their ear, that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven were those people that looked the part on the outside, not a simple, trusting, faithful, obedient child. And so he says, it starts with humbling yourself. You see, humility is this, as I realize I've really got nothing figured out on my own that I can't accomplish, I can't attain, I can't be right with God on my own. And so I believe entering the kingdom of heaven, being right with God, being saved, begins with humility. We know pride is the enemy of everything good. Pride keeps us from salvation. Pride keeps us from what true success is according to God. And so he goes on to say in verse 5, And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. And so it makes a strong connection not only to helping those who are defenseless, maybe who are poor, who need to be taken care of, uh, like a child, uh, 
that whenever we care for them, we're in, by in turn welcoming Christ, but also that applies spiritually. And so I want you to turn the page to Matthew 19 because Jesus had a lot to say about being like a child and trusting dependence. And so in Matthew 19, he picks up again. There's so much that happens between 18 and 19 from what we just read. But, but I want to uh, drop you into verse 13 here of chapter 19. Once again, the children were brought to Jesus. Uh, and it says in verse 13 of Matthew 19, the children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray. But what happened? Sounds like the disciples didn't learn their lesson. But the disciples, what they do? They rebuked them. Why would they rebuke them? Why? Because he was too important for them. He didn't have time for them. He needed to deal with the others. He was uh, a, this religious figure that uh, didn't have time for them. And so the disciples still didn't get it. Going back from Matthew 18 to here, they still didn't get it. And so in verse 14 of Matthew 19, Jesus said, Leave the children alone and don't try to keep them from coming to me. And then once again, he really reiterates what he said in the chapter before, because the kingdom of heaven, who's it belong to? Such as these. Not because they were short, not because they were small, not because they were five or eight years old, but because they simply trusted by faith and were dependent upon the one they knew they could depend upon. Just like a child who hopefully that has a good mom and a dad and a functional mom and dad that cares for them, they just simply trust and they depend upon that mom and dad. In a much greater way, many times over, God says, unless you come to this place where you simply trust and depend by faith, on this one whom God has sent. You can't be a part of God's kingdom. And that's why we have a lot to learn from, from kids. And so sometimes we, we finish this passage here and we miss this huge contrast. So this is twice now, just in two chapters, he's talked about children. Uh, but in the next verse uh, after that, uh, it says in verse 15, uh, after placing his hands on them, he went on from there. But I believe this next passage gives us a powerful contrast between children and what we think it takes to be right with God. So will you read on with me in verse 16? Just then someone came up to him and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? I think that is the most important question of today. So I, I believe the question is accurate and right that this person asked. And I think it should be one of the most important questions in your life. What must I do to have eternal life? Because eternal life is not just physically living forever in this body. It's having eternal relationship and communion with God forevermore. Whether we live one more day or 50 more years, there's an eternal relationship we have with God even after our physical body finishes the journey. But this person, we're going to know who he is in just a moment, which is going to really add to the story. This person asked him, what must I do to have eternal life? Have you ever thought about that in your life? It's, it's actually worth a pause if you're here today and uh, you've not personally come to this place of conviction where the Holy Spirit has convicted you to turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. What do you need to do to be right with God? What do you need to do to have eternal life? And then in verse 17, Jesus always had a great response. Many times Jesus responded to a question with another question, didn't he? Uh, it really got to the heart of the matter. And so verse 17, he says, why do you ask me about what is good? He said to them, him, there is only one who is good. That's pretty interesting. He says, why do you ask me what is good? There's only one person who's good, and that's God. And so by implication, secondhand, he's more or less saying, do you really think I'm good? Because good is a whole lot more than what you think good is. Because a lot of us would say, hey, I'm a good person. And as many of us have taken the good test over the years, we realize we fail the good test miserably because God's statute, God's uh, standard is so much higher that we have failed in every part. But sometimes we don't become honest with that. 